I'm Victor Yates for Culture, that's Culture with a Q. And today I'm talking with activist, writer, and event coordinator, Carolyn Weisinger, about an organization she's working with to screen a groundbreaking film. So how did you get involved with Sister Cinema? I got involved with Sister Cinema because they were actually screening a film in Atlanta called, called, called Bumming Cigarettes and I had contacted them about screening it here in Long Beach. Um, unfortunately, they had already done all of their setting up their screenings throughout the nation for that particular film, but they were very interested in doing screenings here in Southern California. Um, so I got together with Isis, who is the founder of Sister Cinema, and also Nicolas and Galvez, who I work with at the Art Exchange in Long Beach. And we were able to put together a series of these screenings here in Long Beach. The movie that we're going to talk about is called Living with Pride, Ruth Ellis at 100. Why is it important for our viewers to see this film? I think the most important thing that we would gain by seeing this film, why we need to see this film, is because in our community, we don't have very much intergenerational communication. We don't, unfortunately, since we spend a lot of our time in social atmospheres like clubs and parties and picnics, a lot of our elders we don't get to see very often. And I actually learned about Ruth Ellis through the Black Lesbians United organization. I'm at their retreat. Every space is named after a legendary black um, lesbian activist. Oh, well. So she has her own space at the retreat called the Ruth Ellis um, Space. So when I saw that we had this um, documentary where I could actually learn about her life, so many things that she talks about going back to, she was born in 1899. Wow. So when she was my age, I'm 34, I don't know if I should say that. But I'm 34, when she was my age, she was going through the same thing that we're going through right now. It's not a very, it's a deep documentary, but not deep, deep as far as talking so much about fear, you know. It's really literally about her life. So that's the really important thing is learning about our elders that we don't get to see very often and who are heroes where that pay away. wanted to read a description from the documentary. Ellis tells about discovering her sexuality some 80 years ago and when discussing her romantic involvement, which included one relationship that lasted 35 years, the film is illustrated with vintage photographs of Ruth Ellis, her family, lovers, and friends, and footage shot in the present day. Right. So that description got me to thinking about archival techniques and history and how will people know about the struggle today, about the struggle for human rights and the struggle for marriage equality, which leads me to the next question. Okay. Is it important to document our experiences now? It is the most important thing to document our experiences now because if we don't tell the story, who's going to tell it? Um, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to do a lecture at the Butch Voices Los Angeles. Butch Voices is another organization that's all about um, building community within the Manchester Center community. And I had the opportunity to do a workshop there about um, Butch intellectuals. So that one was specifically for the Butch community, but it's still kind of the same idea. If who, we need to really support our documentarians, our writers, um, videographers who are really putting together this archival footage, footage and, and holding this on for the next generation because if we let the other descendants of the community define who we are, we already know what they think of us now. Okay. So what do we what do we think they'll say for us 20, 30 years from now? I'm going to backtrack a little bit okay. and I want to learn a little bit more about Sister Cinema. Okay. So can you give me information about that organization? Well, Sister Cinema was started in the Seattle area by a young lady named Isis Asari, and I apologize if I said your name wrong, Isis. Um, but she started the organization there, um, and it started really as a way, kind of how we still do it, to get to build community within the queer women of color community, showing documentaries that have been done for us and by us. Um, because, unfortunately, we don't always get as much support as we should from the outside community as well as from our community. So it was really an opportunity to bring us together and, and draw exposure to those films that are being made 
Um, she started there in Seattle, branched out to Portland, and I we have about nine cities that have been launched so far going through summer of this year. We the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. We have Seattle, we have Portland, we have here in Long Beach, we have Atlanta, we have Cincinnati. Um, we've launched Kingston with you and I talked about we've launched Kingston. I know that she's launching Oakland because she's recently moved to Oakland. Oh. Um, and we're, they're also getting ready to launch in Toronto, Canada, hopefully very soon. When I looked on the website and I saw that there was a sister cinema that was going to be launched in Kingston, my jaw dropped because I know about the adversity that the LGBT community experiences in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, it's, it's very brave, but it's also necessary. And I applaud ISIS for actually attempting to do something that is needed in that community. So um, very brave kudos, kudos to you, ISIS. Some of our viewers who live in the Long Beach area and the LA area, um, they may want to get involved with some of the organizations that you're a part of. So when you said Butch Voices, can you tell me more about Butch Voices? Butch Voices is a national organization that was started, um, it was actually started and launched in Oakland, um, but it was started by Joe LeBlanc, who is a genderqueer Butch who actually resides in Portland, but does a lot of work out throughout the nation and he's uh, originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, which is how we kind of connected because I'm also from originally from Louisiana as well. Um, it started as a national conference that they had in Oakland. I believe that was in 2009 they had the first national conference. Now, um, an opportunity to get people to come together with workshops, with artistic uh, projects. Um, there were nighttime activities, social activities to really get the, the Bay Area community that was there. Um, to, together and really enjoy the weekend, but they really got a lot of people with, throughout the nation involved. I was really, really surprised even now to this day how many people throughout the nation were have been able to get involved because it's such a necessary movement. I can't, I really can't think of another movement of that scale that is bringing together masculine identified women. Um, so they came together, and I believe it was 2009 was the first um, national conference. And then in 2010, they did regional conferences. So they had a conference here in LA, they had a conference in New York, um, and I apologize, I don't know all the cities that they had here, they had regionals. Um, but at that time, the intent was to have regional conferences where people in the different areas can get to those conferences, because not everybody, of course, can get to Oakland, and let people know what the, the intent of the organization is, which is really, once again, building community, building awareness, educating people about both the issues with, um, outside of our community as well as the issues that we still have inside of our community as masculine identified lesbian women. Um, so it's really done a lot as far as building, whether it's fashion, whether it's health, it was really, uh, they had a lot of support from the Brown Boy Organization, which is a leadership uh, organization that was also started in Oakland. And one thing that they have really been uh, striking with this year has been health within the, the Bush community because you know, so many um, women in the beauty community don't necessarily feel as comfortable going to get their, we'll say their women's screenings and all those good things because you don't always want to have a male doctor doing those type of things. But they've been really stressing the importance of knowing your status of whatever type of health issue that you're having. They have actually a health pamphlet on their site which people can access and have um, sent to them. So it's really been a blessing for that organization. That's interesting um, because it's Butch Voices, it's an organization for <clears throat> masculine identify lesbians or trans men? Well, the, the official mission list as masculine of center of women. Masculine, masculine of center, center persons, rather, because that was a title that was actually a, a term that was coined by Cole, who is the uh, founder of Brown Boy. Masculine of center is like an, a term that encompasses all of our identifications. So whether it's a butch identified woman, whether it's a trans man, anything that's, that's in that spectrum is all encapsulated in masculine of center. And, and so that is what butch voice is. The, the term, people have different ideas of what butch means, but within the organization it's really about servicing that community that falls under that umbrella. Where Butch Voices
voices gets together with kind of the more feminine center part of the community? Well, we have a lot of feminine allies who do help us with the good voices, but there is also a, a femme symposium. So it's like the femme component okay. of good voices, completely separate. They're, they're not one together, but we, of course, as a community, help each other. Okay. So there's a, a whole other um, segment called femme symposium, and I believe that there's also where we have brown boy. I believe that someone created a brown girl organization. Don't oh. quote me on that. I okay. might be wrong. I see a lot of organizations <laughs> throughout the day, but I'm almost positive there's also that as well. I wanted to talk about Leadership Long Beach, which you just graduated from, so congratulations. So tell us about the organization and what was your experience like, like in that organization? Leadership Long Beach is a, a great, great organization. It's about connecting principal leaders in the city of Long Beach. Okay. Um, Civic-minded activists, people who just love Long Beach. And the, the program itself is a 10-month program. It's about usually the first Monday of every month. Sometimes we'll have activities between then that we um, are assigned as a class. Um, but it's really about exposing us to all the different organizations and opportunities there are to serve in Long Beach, whether it's on boards of nonprofits, whether it's um, outside activities such as this, the Saturday Night Lights, which is a activity during the summer where they give children the opportunity to come play at the parks during the nighttime. Oh. So different types of, I believe that he said yesterday at graduation that he counted, we've interacted with about a hundred leaders and organizations throughout the city of Long Beach. Um, and it, I can tell you some very interesting stories about my, <laughs> my time in leadership Long Beach, whether it was doing ride-alongs and getting to ride and sit in the middle of the street while they shut down the traffic for an accident, or whether it was getting to meet um, the SWAT team and the diving team, or being a principal for a day at a, a local school, but it's really about exposure to all the services, and it really um, was a great change in my life because I, especially in our black queer community, a lot of our community is still centered in LA. No matter where we are in Southern California, we end up in LA probably somewhere during the weekend doing our different services. So my life was centered in LA. It's really served me as far as getting me more integrated in the city of Long Beach, both within the queer community and out in other aspects of the community. So my personal goal has really been to start creating more opportunities like Sister Cinema, where we can start building that queer people of color um, base in Long Beach. And not just people of color, but one thing is, there are a lot of queer people of color in Long Beach and we are always going to LA. So this is to give us opportunity to have activities here in Long Beach that we can do. So what is the queer experience like in Long Beach on the more creative side? Are there a lot of events that are going on in Long Beach? There are a lot of events that go on in Long Beach. We, we recently had, I have friends who are there on the board of the Long Beach Gay and Lesbian Pride organization which just had their Pride Festival in May. So one thing that they did is they started, they launched a lot of different smaller events to lead up the Pride. Okay. So they had one event called Sister Spit, which was a poetry event, um, where they got it, it was a, you're sad you missed that. No, they, they, <laughs> they spoke, they, they read it. Oh, okay, yeah. oh yes, they sure I, did. I, they I, did. I love Michelle T, and I love Text the Queen, and there Sing was- Sing the Poet. Yes. 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 <laughs> and I love, there, I think she's Filipino, but I'm not sure. And she had a chat book called A White Girl Named Shaquana. And you know what? Speaking of, I, and she's going to be so angry when she sees this interview, but I know exactly who you're speaking mm -hmm. of. And she actually just opened up a business in Long Beach called oh. Slice and Dice. And I must say here on camera, everybody go to Slice and Dice on the corner of, of Abispo and Anaheim. Mm -hmm. So it's good. awesome, but I know you're speaking. So what's what's the business? It's a, it's actually a sandwich shop. Okay. It's a very awesome queer owned sandwich shop, and I love to go there. And, and I learned of them through another connection through Leadership Long Beach. Okay. So it's it's funny how all of these kind of tie together. But they had the sister speak. Um, they have the different. There's the Long Beach Cinema Tech, which is not necessarily a, a queer organization, um, but definitely is also invested in showing. Uh, 
movies that are reflective of all the different segments of the of the city. Um, of course, we have Hamburger Marys where they have the different shows there. Jules Long Beach, which I, I love, they have different shows there. Hamburger Marys. So there's all different ways of getting involved in arts and culture in the city of Long Beach. Would you call yourself a leader within the LGBT community? I would call myself an emerging leader within the LGBT community. I've been working in, in the community for, for quite a while. I actually started out doing a poetry event in Little Tokyo, which is called Indigo Lounge, which is not a queer event, but it was run by myself and another friend of mine who we were both involved in the queer community. And at that time, when I stopped doing that event, I decided, because I'm a football fan, that I wanted to do an event that got lesbians together to just sit around and watch football. Okay. But we had to find a place to do it. We had to find an empty place to do it. Okay. So we found a bar in Long, in, I'm sorry, in, in Los Angeles, right in the middle of Crenshaw Boulevard, and we basically took over this bar. And by Crenshaw the Crenshaw Boulevard. Right. It's right in the middle of Crenshaw. <laughs> and it was the bar was called Crenshaw Live. And by the end of the season we had we started having about a hundred lesbians oh, wow. a, a Sunday okay. to watch football. And we got the opportunity. That was actually the year the Saints won the Super Bowl. So it was a whole lot of fun. Uh, but when I stopped doing Crenshaw Live, at this point I'm still living in Long Beach and I'm driving all the way to LA just to watch football. So I decided that I wanted to start doing it here in Long Beach. And um, that's when I started doing that event here in Long Beach. And then just started working with different organizations, with Voices, Black Lesbians United. And I've worked with all of these for quite a, a, a while. But recently, especially since I've been doing Leadership Long Beach, I've been able to see myself get, get even more involved. Which is why even though I've been in the community for a while, I still call myself an emerging leader. Because I, I have uh, mentors that I look up to such as Jeanette Bronson from Black Lesbians United, such as Marquita Thomas from Out and About, um, such as the, the ladies from Chocolate and Wine, Mignon Moore and uh, DJ One, who have really been great mentors to me, Vivian Perez and Ladies Touch, who've all been great mentors. And to me, those are the, the great leaders, and I'm, I'm inspiring and coming along behind them. And I get, I'm just thankful to be able to have those as friends that I can get to know and go to when I need to talk about something. talk about your writing. Okay. How would you describe your writing? My writing is, I've always, ever since high school, described my writing as just me sitting around talking. Like I could write down everything that you and I are saying, kind of twist it to, <laughs> into a narrative form. And because my writing is just, I've always been a storyteller. Okay. Really the way that both my blogging as well as my fiction writing is just me telling stories, usually about people, even in fiction, just people that are around me. Okay. Do you have any future events coming up? Well, we have um, Sister Cinema, which is a, a monthly event. So every third Sunday of the month, we have a new Sister Cinema. This month, of course, is Living with Pride. Next month will be um, Campbell X's Stud Life, where we'll be screening for July. Um, we're getting ready to do, we're going to be doing an independent screening as a fundraiser for Black Lesbians United, and that's more than likely going to be on July the 13th, also at the Art Exchange. I'm looking to do a more hip hop thing, dance event. Um, I was lucky enough to partner with, not necessarily partner with, we were actually planning a, a, a party to kick off Long Beach Pride at the Art Exchange. Okay. And we were able to connect with the, the ladies at um, Artful Thinking who were planning the first annual Dyke March in Long Beach. And so we connected and, and had what was called the Blue Party. Okay. So I'm going to be doing another hip hop thing event hopefully in July. Um, those are going to be all from my personal events because coming into fall, that's when Black Lesbians United is going to be in September. Butch Voices is going to be in August. I'm also on the board of the Long Beach Lambda Democrats. We're going to be having our gala in November. Okay. That's a lot. <clears throat> you said something that I wanted to comment on. So you had an event called Indigo Lounge. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of Damio? Damio is like my brother. Oh. I, do you want me to check Damio right now? I'm not playing. And Damio is 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 on the board of Black Lesbians United. Okay. 
So we have worked on so many events together. Daniel, of course, performed at Indigo Lounge before and, and recently did a picnic for Black Lesbians United. So, uh, What events did you guys do? Um, well, we did the picnic for Black Lesbians United. We, as a, as a collective, are getting ready for the retreat. So I can say that that's an event that we're doing together. But we're connected, connected. So Daniel had an open mic, spoken word, poetry event. I can't think of the name of the it. The Damn Slam. The Damn Slam. So why don't you guys do an open mic, spoken word event together? Damn, yo, we should do that. Well, I have been looking, <laughs> I have been craving to get a group of queer individuals, spoken word. On uh, a regular basis. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, because I think that's something that's missing from the LA community and the Long Beach community. So we need to get that together. We will text her after we get off camera and we will talk about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to share with our viewers at Culture? Um, the most important thing, having a name like Culture, just really making sure that you're connected to the queer culture. I think that right now we are blessed to be at a time where we're having so many opportunities to document and tell our stories in so many different ways. Um, oh, I know what I didn't mention, speaking of okay. culture. I have two books that are going to be coming out in fall. How okay. did I forget that? <laughs> okay. So, um, I will definitely keep you informed so you can let the viewers know when, when those are published. But there's so many books, movies, uh, so many different outlets that we have right now to really tell our stories and just make sure that you're supporting all of them so that we can continue to do this great work and make sure that our stories are told for our future generations. Okay. So plug your two books right now. So I'm going to have two books that are going to be published with Glover Lane Publishing. Um, one which is going to be a compilation of all of my blogs and articles. The blog itself was called Nocturnal Emissions. I'm almost positive that that's what the book will be called. You never know what happens when pressing happens. The second is going to be a, a um, series of linked stories that I actually did during my MFA time at Antioch University. Okay. So I'm finally going to close my close that book and send it out into the world that, as my mentor always says. Okay. So they should be released in September, October. Okay. They should be available on Glover Lane Publishing. Okay. So tell our viewers where they can connect with you on any social media websites. You can connect with me on almost any social media network. I'm on Facebook. You can simply plug in my name, Carolyn Weisinger. I'll come right up for you. You can connect to me on Twitter. I don't really tweet as much as I used to, but I'm trying. Um, my Twitter name is Caramel, C-A-R-A underscore M-E-L-9-7 on Twitter. I have the same name on Instagram, which is my favorite place these days besides Facebook. And I'm recently getting into Vine so recently that I don't know how to find me on Vine, but I'm there. So maybe if you put in my name, or maybe if you put in Caramel also, it'll come up. But I'm on there somewhere. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you for speaking with us, and I wish you much success in the future. Thank you for having me. And this is Victor Yates for Culture. That's Culture with a Q. Stay tuned.